Excuse me, excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Yes. Who are you? Who are you? I am the famous moat hunter. Moat hunter? Yes. And Sherry says, what's a moat? <laughs> I'm looking for moats in people. Can you tell me what a moat really is? A moat is a small, that's why I got my sure I don't get up. Binocular here is a small little speck in somebody's eye. Maybe it could be unforgiveness. It could be lying. It could be cheating. It could even be pride. Well, well, Moat Hunter, I guess I could call you that. Yes. How are we doing? Have you found any moats in this forest? No, not yet, but I think I see one. You can look I hard. You can look hard enough. <laughs> Well, you're the infamous, you're the famous moat hunter, and you see nothing here? Nothing. What is well, wrong? I tell you what you need to do. What? They are receiving good teaching, and if they become a doer of the word, they need to become, a, you know, and see that God blesses them. You're not going to find fault here, because every day they ask God to cleanse them so they don't carry fault around. So, my suggestion to you, sir, is go ahead and relax, sit down, and listen to the word. What do you think? What do you think, congregation? Should he sit down and listen to the word? Okay, very good. Let's give our moat hunter a big hand clap. Amen. I appreciate those moat hunters. <laughs> yeah, from time to time, we're going to do little skits and want to do those kinds of things. So you might be thinking about something that, you know, and bounce it off my wife and myself. All right. We've been teaching about new creation realities. In today's lesson, the subtitle of it is called Spiritual Mindedness. Spiritual Mindedness. Now, I want to talk to you about two serious things that maybe you're not aware of. Maybe you are. What season is this? And don't say fall. <laughs> this is what we call the autumn solstice. Now, I'm not a believer in new age. I'm not a believer in, in witchcraft or anything, but I want to tell you, this is the holiday and the month that, that the witches and the people that are into that kind of stuff are fasting, cutting themselves, killing animals, neighbors' cats and stuff, to curse the Christian church, the Jews, and Christian families. So if you notice a little bit more shrapnel going around in the atmosphere, and a little bit of weirdness, and and what the enemy does is he sets one against another, opinion against one opinion, and one decision against another, and creates that atmosphere that he could feed on. Well, Pastor Kerry, what would she, we do? Now, I told you a little earlier in the service that I sat down with a real satanic witch and her little, uh, what I call, her vessel, her chalice. Anybody here know what a chalice is? It's a cup. When witches have somebody that's not mentally all there, they fill them with demons. And then they bring them into the church and they release all the demons within the church. So I sat down with her and I talked and I said, tell me about some of the things you were doing. I act interested. So she says, yeah, we could do all the Christian languages. We can even fake praying in tongues. No, they can't because it doesn't sound full of love. But they can think they can. They got all the things. We come in, our job is to go into a church and stir up trouble all the time. Uh, if we can't find a boyfriend and break up with a boyfriend, so, so now there's a division in somewhere, and we go in and we create havoc. I said, well, why do you do that? It's just the most powerful people in the world are Christians. And if they ever knew who they really were, instead of playing games, we would be shut down. So big, but they don't. They play games. They, they kid each other, not truthful. They think of themselves, and so it becomes easy picking. So in the, our particular time, we go in, destroy churches, and then we write it down as our conquest. So right now, we're going to do something. 
together if you want to do this. This is volunteer. I'm going to have us renounce witchcraft. If you've ever had anything in your life, like a tarot card, you had your palms read, you went in, had a seance, or, or you did anything like that, and you started messing with that, maybe in the past, we need to break that off of you. Okay, we need to break it off of you. And so I'm going to show you how to do it. Okay, whenever something weird's going around in the atmosphere and it's not normal, bind it up and take authority over it. So follow my words, okay, and mean it with your heart. Say, Father God, in Jesus' name, I submit to you and I plead the blood of Jesus. I renounce all witchcraft, every spell, every curse that could ever be formed against me. I break its power. I renounce its ability to affect me. And instead, in Jesus' name, my focus is on you and on obeying you. And the enemy can't touch me from here on out. In Jesus' name. Now lift your hands and receive that anointing. There it is. It's dropping right down on you. If you believed it, it'll drop down right on you. Okay. All right, so in All Hallows' Eve, is what, that's what they do. So if you ever notice, I happen to notice right after summertime, they get, they get after it. People come in after summer, and they're completely backslid and beat up, ripped apart. Summer's not supposed to do that to us. So remember that you are in a fallen world where people don't love your Jesus. Jesus said they would hate me, they will hate you. So don't be surprised that people talk about you and do that. Just keep the word change. Everyone say the word chain that is spoken against me. I break it in Jesus' name. See, so let's say you got a relative that doesn't like you. And they, their job is talking about you all the time. Those words Satan can use against you. So you every once in a while, you just break the word chain. And everything spoken against you that's not God's will for your life. And boom, you'll notice a release. See, so the enemy has everybody helping him by speaking evil. We told you three weeks ago what Christian witchcraft was. Speaking bad about another Christian. Okay. Whether they deserve it or not. The idea is it opens the door for us to be harassed. Now, I don't know about you. If I could punch a guy and repent and not have any retribution, you know, if he's a devil, I would. But I know that even Michael the archangel did not bring wriggling accusations. Peter talks about be careful of those that are not afraid to talk bad about their governments and those kind of things. Why? Because it creates an atmosphere where the enemy is present. Now, how about you? Do you want your arch enemy hanging out at your house, renting a room from you? So just simply say no from now on in Jesus name. Okay, the next thing is I want you to recognize one other thing. My pastor taught us this. My wife and I discussed this earlier today. Have you ever noticed that God has you headed one way? And then when the enemy's around, he tries to switch you the other way. There seems to be an abrupt change. Whenever there's an abrupt change, it's not of God. If you're headed north and suddenly... Somebody says something to you, and now you switch, and you're headed south. Couldn't be God. God is always consistent. He always lays things out over and over and over again, so us really intelligent, intelligent people can pick it up. <laughs> but whenever you see something, like, for example, I always was trained my children. When my children suddenly turn north or suddenly stop operating normally, something's up. All of a sudden, you, everything's going great, and suddenly you're sick. Something's up. Don't accept that. These are the things that the enemy tries to lure with. Remember the scripture says, when every man is tempted, he's drawn away. So, if I could, I, I would do it all for you. It's if you don't start your day off for really surrendering and saying, God, do something with my head that always wants to second guess you. If you don't do something with that, you're, you're, you're going to get up to about a teenager and you're going to stay in that realm until you break through. Okay, and we have to break through ourselves. Can you say amen? And I, I taught this years ago, I'll teach it real quickly, is that who lives in you? 
And he has, in order to get out and express himself where everybody can see him in our life, he has to break through our blockages that we have in our soul. Hello. And he'll come up on the inside and he'll get to a place where it says, you have to, nobody really likes you. And immediately you start wrestling with a thought and an idea. What do we call that? A stronghold. Our job is to cast that down. God has to rise up. And we're going to cover that in the area of light. Everyone say light. light. There's no darkness at all in light. Amen. All right. So shall we get going? Yeah. All right. New creation, reality, spiritual mindedness. I want to say good morning to you. Jesus is on the throne. Amen. God has never lost a war or fight yet. And that's why I like to be with him. All right, so today we're going to learn the importance of being spiritually minded. We have a spirit mind and we have a physical carnal mind. The mind is a wonderful connection between our spirit man, I say the gut or the core of man, to our flesh so we can show expression. So if our spiritual mindedness is interrupted and distracted or frustrated, we're unable to reflect Christ properly. Come on. If your mind's preoccupied, how's your prayer life? See, there there's, like, seems to be a kind of a worrish thing going on. I'm not faulting anybody. And if I hit you on your toes and you feel like you're slammed to the pew, it's not intentionally done. Maybe God wants to get a hold of you. All right, so let's continue on. So if our mind is focusing on the world, people, and or self, we are not being able to operate properly because we're not heavenly minded. Instead, we're becoming earthly minded. We all know the scripture says if we be risen with Christ, that means you're born again. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. For you are dead and your life is hidden in Christ and God. That's who you are today. We talked about earlier that church is not a laundromat. We don't come to church and draw attention to ourselves and act up. No, we come to church all polished. You dealt with that in your prayer closet and in your, your car on the way here. You don't bring your dirty laundry in here for the church to, to deal with. No, you bring it to Jesus for him to deal with, and you bring what he gives you, those robes of righteousness, into the house of God where we can celebrate before the Lord. I've, I've been to many, many a prayer meeting. They all started off pretty good, and then people started coming to the prayer meeting with their burdens. Then it all became about what they're suffering and what they're going through instead of asking God to change and cause us. Amen. You see? And the little person that has the problems is now the center of the attention. We are little people. Die to yourself. Get out of the way. Now, Christians don't learn that. We carry ourselves with us all through our Christianity. And if anybody insults us, it ruins our week. Look at your neighbor and say, not me. So if you are... Self-conscious, self-thinking, everything people say to you that challenges you is going to appear like people are picking on you. Come on, have you ever been there? Huh? You got your feelings a little higher than they should be, and somebody said, like your mom, says, now clean your room. <laughs> you know, straighten up your act. They don't like me here. Come on now. You're supposed to be dead. Dead people don't get irritated. Dead people don't run around telling everybody what they want to do. But dead people are perfect for the devil to use. Digging up fluffy stinks up the congregation. All right, let's move on. <laughs> I haven't even finished my paragraph. So, everyone smile at your neighbor and say, it's so nice to be in the house of God. All right, so let's go on. It says, but God now lives in you and I. Do you say amen? So it doesn't get so that we don't get in the way we need to pray. I asked my, my pastor years and years ago, I says, what is the purpose of praying? And he gave me an answer. But he says, number one purpose is to get you out of the way so God can get things done. 
what do you mean? He says, when you go to God, you surrender. And you ask God to move you out of the way so that he can use you in a different way. And then when you do that, you find God beginning to work. He says, we all have a resistor in us. How many here know what a resistor is? You know, if you have a resistor in your, it keeps it from overloading. It's a, it kind of regulates everything. We have a resistor called our mind. And if we're unwilling to do anything, God will appeal to our mind, but he can't get us to do it if we don't want to. Hello? We have to want to. We have to want to change. We have to want to do those things. Say amen, somebody. So when we are in a fleshly mind, we become offensive, might not even know that we offend others. The Bible calls it, no man gathers grapes from thorns and no man gathers figs from thistles. What Jesus was referring to is the religious people. Don't represent God as a crab, crabby person. Don't represent God as looking down your nose and preaching at people. That's thorns and thistles. Rather be sweet and full of fruit. Can you say amen? Make them want to come to you and ask you why you are so happy, so blessed. That's what Linda does over there. <laughs> Put you on the spot. You got to get this tape. Amen. And God bless our mode hunter. He did a good job, didn't he? All right. So let's go on. All right. So changing our spiritual thinking. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Verse 20 through 24. And now as you go there, let's look at our scripture. Can we have our main scripture up? All right. Okay. Everybody, this is our scripture. Hey, sis. No. Okay, here he goes. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. What happened to your old man? Crucified. What happened? Crucified. Would you remind the devil next time he lies to you? Hey, I'm crucified. Shut up. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin, pinch your body, the body of sin might be done away with. So your trouble, remember we carried last week, you have two enemies, the devil and your flesh. So be done away with it. We should no longer be slaves to what? Sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Notice there's no S. That means Satan's nature. Sin is Satan's nature. Okay? Now, if we died with Christ, we believe also we shall live with him. Likewise, much the same way, you shall also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God. Then he says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? So we're to live a crucified life. That doesn't mean you can't play, laugh, can't enjoy your husband or wife. No, what that means is that you don't allow sin to have any more say in your life. Right? And we talked about it last week that being a child of God, we're not longer sinners saved by grace. We're a child of God. God deals with us as a son, as a, a daughter. So when we make a mistake, he doesn't condemn us nor throw us away. He shall never leave us nor forsake us. Now, you might have opened your mouth sometime along and not knowing any better. You say, well, God is left to me. Shut that up. You don't know what you're talking about. You spend so much time thinking about yourself, you say stupid things like that. God does not ever leave his children. And to say that, you slap God in the face. So the devil would just like you to say it all day, wouldn't he? But we're wiser than that because we're children of God. Say amen. Now, Ephesians 4 verse 20 says, but you have not so learned Christ. Here Paul is writing to those Christians saying, look, you're acting like the world. 
you're, you're speaking like the world. And believe it or not, that's not right. And he says, you've not learned Christ right. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed that you heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in where? Where are you? Now, see, you folks, most Christians never get that. You're in my church. You're in God's church. You're in God's living room. You're not outside in your truck. Okay? So that means if you're in Christ, where are you? All right, then don't act out your own selfishness because you're in Christ. Don't insult the king. Walk reverently and of a humble heart. All right, let's go on. It's quiet in here. But you, thank you, that we, you and I, put off concern our former mannerisms, conduct. The old man which grows corrupt according to the deep, deceitful lusts. That's talking about your flesh. Your flesh, every day if you let it, will get worse. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, when my body wants to get worse, I crucify it. And so later on in my life, I learned that if I did that daily, my body will come in line. But if I only waited till my body got out of sorts and then I surrendered, then I'm missing it. I'm rising up, shutting down, rising up, shutting down, rising up, shutting down. Does that sound like a lot of Christians walk? Roller coaster. What's that song? Roller coaster. Yow. You know. <laughs> We're not supposed to be going like that. We're not supposed to be switching to our head, to our heart, our heart to our head. We're supposed to be walking in step with God. Say amen. Now, if that's not happening, don't panic. The cure is meeting with God. Pastor, are you ever going to get off of that meeting with God stuff? If you want me to die, I will. If you want me to become another backslidden preacher... I need my time with God, and you do too. Trouble is, maybe you don't know it. How do you like a gravelly walk where you're always fighting and effering all the time? Shows a lack of prayer. Don't get mad at me. It's the truth. Whenever you're fighting and wrestling and doing all this, you're missing out in the quality of prayer God needs for you to be with him. So he can work those things out, and you don't have that sensation or feeling. He can work out. I believe in, if you're going to pray, why do we pray just for today? If you've got a business, pray three months out in advance. Pray for your materials. Pray for the businesses. Get it out three months. How do I go about doing that? Start three months out, Lord, three months from here. I'm asking you to do this, do this, and back it off right up to the present moment. Cover all the product, everything that I need. Work out all the situations before they arise. But no, we're not creative in our prayer. We're sandbagging prayer warriors. Lord, get me out of this one. <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm kind of prodding you a bit to let you know the wisdom that God has given you is far surpasses you're able to figure it out. And only God will show you that wisdom when you sit with him. And he opens your eyes to his possibilities in your life. We're limited to what we can figure out and by the patterns of our past. Hey, if I ran my church the way I ran it before, we'd fail. Because before, I was a kid, didn't know anything. You know, and is it possible for a Christian to barely be saved all their life and act like the world? Sure it is. We see thousands of them. You can't tell the difference between them and the world. And then there are Christians that will all pretty themselves up, but they haven't ever changed in their heart. They're full of dead man's bones because they never went God and said, God, get this out of me. Get this out of me. Well, I did that when I first got saved. Yeah. And you never visited God since. How's your prayer life? Have you ever prayed more than four hours at one time? If you haven't, you need to. Now, I'm not demanding you do something like that. But why haven't you? Just a few minutes with God every morning is all you need. It's a big God, little person, big, big request. It's like the Indians. Make them little fire, get close, and get them warm. 
meet with God, get them close, get what you need. Don't make a big fire and a, a fit and draw everybody's attention and you don't know nothing. Today I'm appalled at what I see as evangelism going on. People yelling and screaming and jumping around and yet they got a gift of anointing or power, but they have no wisdom to be able to instruct somebody how to walk properly with God. We need that wisdom. Say amen. All right. And then it says, look, at concerning the former conduct, the old man, put it off and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That means your attitude. Get with God and let God renew your attitude so you look up. You don't look down at people and look at the faults of others or look at the problems of the world. You look up to God. Say amen. Amen. Lift up your eyes, all you gates. Open up, you everlasting doors. Let the king of glory come in. So, how do we put off our old man? Just think about it. I don't want you to answer. Two, how do we renew our spirit of our mind? You need to know these answers just like you know your name. And three, how do we put on the new man? Created in righteousness and true holiness. So today, we're going to cover these four areas. I, you know, most churches stop right there and they pray and we bad church. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Listen to this. We will cover number one, being born again as a believer. We must set our focus on things above. It's really hard because... If you got a pain in your body, our mind slips on the, yeah, it's just normal. But then we go to God, we pray and ask God to heal us, believe we received, and our mind goes back up on things above. That's how it works. Do not keep your mind focused on things you have no ability to change. Hello? Other than through prayer. Second thing is, our time with God transforms our minds. So I'm not going to talk about just meeting with God. I'm talking about how God breaks off the scales from your thinking. Did you know we only supposedly use 5 to 10% of our mind? That happened when Adam and Eve sinned. Now if you go to God, doesn't God liberate us? Doesn't he see our eyes of understanding become enlightened? Yes. So the more time you spend with God, the smarter you're going to get spiritually you, you don't you're lacking wisdom in something how many times you went to God and God gave you the answer and why have you stopped going to God three months out in advance my papa my dad taught me he says you're going to run a business you have to have running operation finances for three months in advance in case something shuts down you can run for three months well we don't plan for any of that and we think oh how could I do that? See, there you are thinking again instead of praying. First of all, you don't do that. You ask, you simply obey God what he tells you to do. Do you give your business to God? Did you give your family to God? Do what God wants. Thirdly, we should understand we have two minds. A carnal mind and a spiritual mind. And then fourthly, God guards our heart and our mind. Do you know how? How does God guard our heart and mind? If he guards our heart and mind, let me ask you, can Satan get to your heart and mind? So we need to know how that happens. Don't we? Don't we? Unless you want to sleep through the, the sermon. First point, believers must set their focus and mind on things above. Go with me to Luke 11. How many here know you're born again? So God lit your lamp. You are a big lamp. <laughs> In your spirit is the wick, Christ. He's lit your lamp. You're born again believer now. Can you say amen? A child of God. But we need to get that light that's in our lamp out where people can see it, out where we can illuminate our path. Can you say amen? So follow along now as we read. Luke 11 verse 33. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place 
or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. What's he talking about? Don't hide Christ within your flesh. So people see you and they don't see Jesus. Hello. Don't hide the light in your flesh under a basket or under a bed. Bring it out where everybody that comes to you and talks with you can see that you have the light. Someone say, oh me. Do we do that, Pastor Kerry? You better believe it. People, sometimes they, I'm just going to avoid that. Okay, here, listen. The lamp of the body is the eye. Notice it didn't say eyes. Therefore, when your eye is good or single, your whole body be full of light. But when even, uh, but when your eye is bad, I asked the Lord about this. Listen, God says, if you're focusing on me, your eyes are going to be filled with light. But if you focus on the world and all of its problems, you're focusing on the bad. Don't look at me that way. And your body will be enlightened, but you'll be enlightened all about what's wrong with everything. Let's read on. You'll see it come right, come right alive. And he says, Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness, because you're focusing too much on the earth, people, and the world, and everything else instead of God. We don't mean to. This is, then if your whole body is full of light because you're focusing on Jesus, having no part dark, the whole body will be filled with light. So when the bright shining of the lamp gives you light. And who's the one that has all light? Amen. God himself. And who does, where does he dwell? You needed to get it up so that he enlightens all of your view. God sees 360, we only see what's ahead of us. That's why we sit, we fellowship with him, so he opens our future to us, and we begin to pray for things. Hello. Point one, as Christians, we are, we are the lamp that contains the oil and the light. We are to elevate our focus on things above, not on things of this earth. We are like a Polaroid camera. How many times have I shared this? Remember those? Point, click, bzzz, right? So, you're looking for answers, and you don't quite know them. You go to God and say, God, I need you to open my eyes so I can see the answer. God will show you things to come. But what we end up doing is we take this beautiful piece of equipment that gets us to focus on God and stuff, and we put on the false others, our moat hunter. Or we look at the world, or we look at our situation, and we can't figure out how we're going to get through this. Oh, the devil would just love you to talk about it. Let's go have a couple other people come over to your house. and Let's have a day discussion on what you don't know what to do. Please don't invite me, because I'm not the kind of friend you want. I, I love this. I have a lot of people say, I really want to be your friend. I says, you already are my friend. No, what I mean is, I want to get to know the real Carrie. Now, if you've ever said that, please, I'm not picking. You're looking at him. I'm yet. You get the garbage with everything else. Listen, I am a pastor. I live pastor, think pastor. Think God, think, well, can't you relate and talk about other things? Absolutely. But the problem is, if I see you acting weird, do you think I could keep quiet and not say anything? Would you really want me to keep quiet and not say anything? No. I have had people get mad at me for telling them the truth, and you have too. So we need to speak the truth in love. Can you say Amen. But I'm not going to be something that I'm not. There's Carrie, the human Carrie, but I'm still a pastor. And there, there's the office of Pastor Carrie, which is supernaturally powerful, and that's me too. 
But if I'm not one and trying to live for the other, not, it's like somebody building only one side of their house and leaving the rest of the house unbuilt or didn't put the roof on. You need to grow in four realms. There's four sides to your house. You need to grow in the realms of everything and you need to be exposed to God. My preaching is good. It's above no average, but it's good. It's good word. It doesn't have any unbelief, I hope, in it. And it encourages you. But my preaching isn't going to change you. It's only going to open your eyes to see that these changes could be. Then you go to God and say, help, help, help. And he brings you up to that standard. That's how it works. Amen. You see the promise. And God energizes you to go follow that promise. And he manifests it. But you have to. Go after it. Say amen. And you are. So that's what's neat about this congregation. You guys go after God. You're not focused on yourself. Say amen. Colossians chapter 3, 1 and 2 gives us a familiar thing. It says, if then you were raised with Christ, set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. For you died and your life's hidden with Christ and God. Second point I want to give you, our time with God transforms our mind. Now, I'm trying to stay unredundant about meeting with God. But you think about it. It says, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Now, I don't know about you. Have you ever had... Now, don't raise your hand. Ever had a struggle with believing something? Come on, I have. And do you remember that man who had a son that was afflicted by an evil spirit? And he brought him to the disciples and they couldn't cast that spirit out. And then he called on Jesus. And Jesus says, oh, faithless generation, bring the son to me. He casts out the spirit. And then he looked at the father and said, you just need to have faith. And the father said something like this. Okay, he said, father, I believe. Help my unbelief. You know, that's okay to say. Because your flesh automatically wants to doubt. And your mind automatically wants to doubt. That's why our exposure to God helps lift our thinking. Helps lift our thinking. You know the story of Gehazi, don't you? Gehazi was a servant of Elijah. And Gehazi was a realist. A realist means what he sees, he believes. So as a realist, he's seeing all the armies of the devil campus around the prophet and around Israelite. And he's going, oh, oh. And he goes into the prophet and he says, oh my God, we're going to perish. Look at all this enemy. And I could just see Elijah yawning and saying, open his eyes, Lord. That he may see there are more with us than there are with them. Sometimes we are in a situation where God needs to enlighten us to the real part of the situation. What's really going on? And he will enlighten us with hope and with faith, not with fear. If you're getting all the time God revealing what the enemy's doing, that's not God. God's balanced. Okay? He, he reveals, God reveals things of what the enemy is doing for me. I'm a pastor. I need to teach. But if all you see is what the enemy is doing in your family and all the problems all the time, you are listening to a bad spirit. And you better rebuke it. Bind it up and rebuke it and cast it away from you. Because it's filling your head like Cain was. Devil jumped on his head and said, kill your brother, kill your brother, kill your brother. And finally, what did he do? Christians are undisciplined, don't pray. The enemy will jump on you and he'll go back to your old patterns and he'll just start writing you and writing you. You need to bind that up, cast that off you, get your mind straight and hang around people that are going to build you up and not tear you down. Say amen, somebody. <laughs> My little sister-in-law says, when you do that, you're yelling at me. You're yelling at me. No, I'm just excited. So our, our meeting with God transformed. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Aren't you glad mercy, God is merciful? That you, your spirit man, see the word you? That you present your body a What? There's, he mentions two of you. You present your body. So our bod is not the real you. Look at John and say, hey, 
I see your bod. <laughs> Mike, well, uh, that's your flesh. How many know you're not going to take this to heaven with you? God's going to change this. So why are you living for what you feel, what you want, what you need to have? Don't you think that's a little twisted? God says, I'm going to give you everything you want and more. Follow me. Rich man comes to Jesus. Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And he says, what do you believe reading in the law? And he says, thou shall not covet. Thou shalt, and he goes through a list. And, and he left one out. Thou shall not covet. You know, thou shall not love other things. He left those out. So Jesus looked at him. He says, there's one thing you are lacking. You're close, but you're lacking this. And the rich man said, what? He says, you need to sell all that controls you. Give it to God and come follow me. Oh, what a thing to say to a rich man. But the point is, do you have things in your life that are controlling you? That are literally dictating to you and God in you on this is the way things are? You have an ability to change that with the Lord. Don't let Satan put you in the old way that you used to live. Well, you barely got along. You're always fighting for that. You go to God and get his wisdom. The first thing God will tell you is he'll give you the wisdom that's peaceable, that's pure, easy to be entreated, full of good fruits. So we go to him for that wisdom. Lord, I'm frustrated. Sounds like I'm just doing what I used to do. Get me out of this, Father. God says, okay, I need you to do a few things for me. Now, I'm not going to tell you what those things are. But when we don't do what God tells us, it's not a good thing. God's not going to slide. You're his child. But it does seem to open doors after a while. We don't want, I don't want the devil in my backyard. I certainly don't want the enemy harassing you guys. So I pray for you every day, not out of fear like Job did. I pray for you, God, give you the blessings. And God, God, most of all, that you have such a relationship with God, you hear his voice clearly every day. How about that? Can I pray that on you? Okay, good. <laughs> all right, Romans 12, look at this. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you, your spirit man, present your bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That phrase there in the Greek means... What is expected of you to have a successful life? Your reasonable service. You're going to exist as a good, solid Christian? Present your body and get it out of the way. Say, oh me. Okay, and he says, your body is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed, pressed down into a mold to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? That you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. 30, 60, 100 fold. Now, what we look in there is we see ourselves laboring to get in the word of God and find some understanding. But what we don't see is the presenting of our body before the Lord. You're not going to get anything out of the word till you get your body out of the way. You present them daily to that, Lord. So now my spirit and my soul are free to draw from the spirit of God and from the word of God. So my spirit man presents my body because the body is just a hang around. Get him closed, get him all set up so it doesn't resist and I just... Receive from the Lord the instructions he has for me. How many here know God loves you? That means that he's willing to make sure you don't stumble. Hello? But if we don't listen to him, we're going to stumble. And I'm not talking about tripping up. I'm talking about acting like a boob. I think that just... <laughs> You have that old bulb with no brain. <clears throat> Hello, a couple of things here. We as believers, number one, must present ourselves daily in order for God daily to adjust our thinking. I don't know about you, but I can be pretty stubborn in my thinking sometimes. We need help. Say amen. Being with God quiets our carnal thinking. Adjusts our focus so our spiritual mind rises to the surface. To be spiritual and light-minded is life and peace. 
When I look at somebody with a spiritual mind, I see all the good things in you. When I look at things through the carnal mind, you know, tainted from the negative, all I can see is what's wrong with everything. Have you ever been there? All you can see was wrong with everything and yourself. You need to die. Get out of the way. Stop thinking of yourself so much. Amen. People that think of themselves get offended easily. And God says you're not to be offended. Otherwise, Satan will offend you every day of your life. Because you become easy picking stickings. And we don't want that to happen. Are you with me? Listen to what this says. I, I just think this is beautiful. So our Heavenly Father helps set our mind on things above. We don't do it ourselves. We want to, but we ask God to help us enlighten our spiritual mind. 2 Corinthians 4, listen to this one, verses 3 through 6. This is great. It says, but even if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those that are perishing. Those whose mind, the God of this age, little g, God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, should, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we do not preach ourselves. What does Carrie preach? The Lord. That's what it says right there. I'm just going to set me up here. So, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord. And ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded, listen, the light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our what? No, it didn't say heads. Hearts. Okay. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. If you never meet face to face, the knowledge of the glory of God will never come up to your understanding. You always be guessing how God is. To Joanna, I said to her, never come to church just trying to figure things out with your head. You become a child. Sit still and stop wandering around and listen to the word in your spirit. Jesus lives there and he's smarter than our head. Once you're still and you listen, God will give you understanding. He gives the understanding. Instead of you trying to figure it out. Because if we figure everything out, who gets the credit? And if we let God figure things out and gives us the understanding, who gets the credit? God will never share the credit with you. So stop thinking for yourself. I didn't say throw your mind away. Just get the spiritual in together and the carnal thinking out. Say amen. <laughs> All right. So we don't preach ourselves, we preach the word, say amen. All right, my next point is, know that we have two minds. Go with me to Romans chapter 8, my, one of my favorite verses. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 6 through 8. Should be in your notes. It says, there is therefore, right at this moment, right now, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me see the hands of those that are in Christ Jesus. So Satan cannot condemn you. If you do something wrong, you're not going to get condemned with me either. I'm not going to condemn you. My job is not to supersede God and make you feel bad. You'll feel bad automatically when you're not doing right. But see, God doesn't condemn. He saves. Tell these preachers out there they're pointing the finger at everybody and condemning the United States and saying judgment's going to happen here. They're all out of order. And if you listen to them, you'll get out of order too. God wants you following him, the shepherd, so he can tell you what to do to help. And so he can get you out of here. But you're criticizing the obvious is only going to goo you up, make you ineffective. Your mind's not going to function properly. Did you know your mind couples your spirit to your flesh? And you're, if you're disjointed in your mind, you can't do anything. We have institutions full of people like that. Moving right along. Therefore, there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. That's you. Who do not walk after your flesh. Don't do what your flesh wants. If you do, you're going to feel condemnation. You're going to feel condemned. 
because your flesh is already rejected in the eyes of the Lord. No one in the flesh can please God. So get out of the flesh first thing daily and follow God in your heart. Simple. It's totally simple that even a caveman can do it, Diane. Are you better than a caveman? Guy, to borrow a Geico commercial. I love you guys. So listen. Okay, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, who lives in you, has made me free from the law of sin and death. So you're a child of God, not, not a sinner saved by grace. You're a child of God. That means God wants you to be safe. He wants you to be good. He wants to help you in every way. He's not going to be free to condemn his child for blowing it. You had a dirty diaper today, so you'll be in your room all day long. But that's how we treat what we think is the gospel. I blew it and God left me. Everything he said is completely demonic because God will never leave us. So what are you quoting? What are you saying? Are you pampering? Oh, feel sorry for me. Here, give me a gun. I'll shoot you. No, I won't do that. The idea is, if we're living for God, you missed it. I said, if we're just living for God, we missed it. It's God living in us. You get it. You let God live through you and you die away from yourself so he can make you into who he promised you to be. And you can enjoy your life, your vacations, your business, all these things because you're running it his way. And how do I know I'm running it his way? Because things run smoother. Didn't say you wouldn't have problems, but he's the smooth man. He's the grace man. Even though things may be chaotic out here, there's a peace in your heart that passes understanding. Let's move on. So it says, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Uh-uh. But those who live according to the spirit, set their minds on the things of the spirit. Everyone say amen. <laughs> For to be carnally minded is death, separation from God. You like to be separated from God, always wondering what God's going to do in your life. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I love that better. Because the carnal man, remember carnality is another name for being a meathead. Meat, carnivorous, meat, carnivorous. Flesh eats carnivorous stuff. Carnal minded means you have a carnivorous mind. All you're thinking about me, 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 me. Hi, everybody. It's what I want to do in the church. No. No, it's what God wants done in the church. Get with it. Follow what he wants. You'll be the happiest person on earth. Everyone, put your prophet rocks down. Don't throw nothing. So, if we dwell in the flesh, we're going to set our minds in the flesh. Now, listen to this. Because the carnal mind is in division against, the God, against God, for it is not subject to obey God, nor the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those that are in the flesh cannot what? So what's the one thing you and I need to make sure we're not in? And how do we go about doing that? Meet with God, crucify yourself every day early. You haven't quite woke up, grab your coffee or whatever you like to do. Sit down with God, get away from everything and surrender. God fill you, God bag you, you know, put you all together. Then you have permission to go through your day with victory. Otherwise, the devil is going to rip you apart every day. Every day until you're calloused and you're hard and your whole thought realm is all about what's not happening in your life and God forbid everyone to have that kind of mentality see not me, me. alright let's finish up with you alright so we're not to walk in the flesh nor to be carnally minded 
So we as believers have an old way of thinking called the carnal or the natural thinking. This oppresses or opposes God's work in our life. Two, when we focus on all that's wrong, it causes our thinking to be tainted and we can't see clearly. There's a scripture, you just write it down, but we haven't got time. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 and 6 says that he who trusts in what they see more than trusts in God will be like a bramble bush in eastern Washington. You know, those ones that are caught in the fences and blow around by the wind. There's no roots. A tumble, tumbling weed. So it says a Christian who doesn't do it right will be just blown around and tumbled. Their eyes are on people. People are fickle. People lie. People don't. So your eyes are in the wrong spot. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he not spoken it? Will he not bring it to pass? Right? Who are we focusing on? Key. If our eyes be single, our bodies full of light. So when we focus on the wrong things, we as a Polaroid camp, camera bring up all the wrong. You see, for me, thinking and dwelling on what's not working doesn't give me the ability to use God's wisdom and receive God's wisdom for what might be changed or cause it to work. Hello. I never allow what comes my way to dictate like a God to me. Don't you do it either. You have God in your heart. Remember the disciples in the boat? Jesus was with them. Yeah, he was sleeping because he wasn't upset. He knew they were going to the other side. But we're so visual. We're so run by things. It's a reminder that we haven't died yet. And naturally, the thing we want to do, and I'm not faulting you, I love you dearly, is get up and go, oh, we're going to perish. It's all going to come down. And Jesus gets up and goes, oh, my. Where's your faith? I'm talking to you now. Where's your faith? In God or circumstances? Where's your faith? In the winds? What's wrong? Are in the God that's in your boat. So maybe Jesus is so at home in your heart, he's asleep. Maybe you should wake him up. Just a joke. Smile at me. You love me? Say, we love you, Carrie. Oh, yes, we do. We love you, Carrie. It's true. My folks are watching, and all my friends are watching. So, you guys bear with me now. Amen. Pray for me. <coughs> All right. Listen to this. Second Corinthians 3, 14 through 16 says, But their mind were blinded, for until this day, the veil has covered our mind. Here's what's happening. When you read the Bible just with your intellect, your mind is covered. You don't read your Bible with your intellect. You read it with your heart. If you don't read it with your heart, the Holy Spirit has nothing to educate you. Because our mind is very shallow and very uneducated. It needs to be educated. But we can't get the education before the horse here. We go meet with God and he liberates our mind to receive revelation knowledge. We meet with God, he liberates our mind to see his hands and not what the enemy's doing. Say amen, somebody. Are you the one that sees the, the pop can half empty or half full? Analyze yourself. Get with God. Analyze. How am I doing, God? And if it's you're like me, the first time I did that, there was silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour. How am I doing, God? Cricket, 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 cricket. I already knew when I asked I wasn't doing so good. So what you do is you say, Lord, I want to surrender and I want you to crucify me. I want you to kill me and get me out of the way. I don't know the first thing about it, God. Help me to take off the old man, put on the new man. When you start praying that way, things will start changing in a mighty, wonderful way. 
then God will start dressing you the way he wants you dressed. You see, I have robes of righteousness on, but I didn't put them on. God put them on me. Put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness on the robes of righteousness. Besides the robe of righteousness, I'm forgiven of my sin. I'm filled with the spirit. But then he clothes me with armor. And the armor's bright, brilliant light Satan can't look at. Then he's not done. He puts Jesus over the top of me. And then puts me into God. And then I could almost hear God saying, all right, Satan, try to get him now. All right, Satan, try to get him now. They're hidden away. See, what happens, though, we get drawn out by our selfishness, by our curiosity, wanting to know. And that's gone beyond what we should do. We should trust and not want to know everything all the time. Can you say amen? The more you wonder, the more you'll wander. The more you trust, the more you're on his bus. He carries you everywhere. And he tells you what to do. So being, having a, a godly spiritual mind doesn't mean throwing your mind away. It means thinking properly with God's help. Say amen. All right, last point. God guards your heart and mind. How in the world does he do that? Can anybody want to try to answer that question? I thought we guarded our heart and mind. No, that's why you're failing. The way you guard your heart and mind is instead of doing things, you pray before you do anything. Look, look at me in that tone of voice. It says, let me quote it for you, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through uh, 7. See, be anxious for nothing, but in everything. What? But in everything. What? Hey, you're going to buy a boat? You better pray. You got somebody you like? Better pray. You got a business deal? You want to make sure it's of God or not? What should you do? This keeps you from being anxious. Hello? What did Jesus say about anxiety? Be anxious for nothing. Right? Be anxious. He says, don't think what you're going to wear, or what you're going to eat. For all these things, the world thinks up. He says, be anxious for nothing. And especially don't be anxious and say anything. So something's not working out, so we talk about it all day long, Marvin. And we give the devil strongholds over us. All right, everybody, clear your throat. Blink your eyes. Say, thank God he's not talking about me. <laughs> I am talking. I'm talking to you. I'm, I want you to get it. Man, if I could just shake you, I can. But some of you are too big. You could just trump me. But the idea is, is some of you, you're still guiding and trying to live the way you did some 20 years ago as a Christian. These are not the same times. These things, the things you did back then are not going to work today. They're going to partially work, but you're going to have to increase your faithfulness to God because of the times in which we live. These are perilous times. Men will be lovers of themselves, covetous, boastful proud they will be haters of what is good despisers of parents disobedience not loyal will betray one another sound familiar they'll have a form of godliness they'll go to church but they'll deny God's power to change them see you should be changing weekly daily becoming better you shouldn't be telling the same old stupid jokes you did 10 years ago. You should be coming better. And if you're not, don't condemn yourself. Follow after God. Say amen. I got my big stick up here. I'm going to whack a couple of you. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> All right, let's finish up. God protects your heart. So Philippians 4 says, be anxious for nothing. That means don't let yourself worry. 
go to God. You real concerned about something? Who do you go to first? My daughter. I'll discuss it with her. God, you have to bring correction to somebody? Who do you go to first? God. Your job is to restore people and not to point out their faults. Just talk to the moat hunter. All right, so let's keep you on. So there it says, let your request be known unto God. And then it says, the peace of God, once you've prayed and given it to God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. If you're not in Christ, there's no guarding. So the whole cure is meeting with God, following God, meeting with God, following God, loving everybody, meeting with God, following with God. If you see something out of order, you pray and ask God to get involved. But you shouldn't be carrying around the stresses of the world, thinking that you have to run the show, and if you don't do something, things are not going to work. You ever felt that way? Smile at your neighbor and say, oh, not me. We all have. That's why we need to learn it, do it God's way. All right, so everyone say, I'm anxious for nothing because I can pray. Look at your neighbor and say, because I can pray, I'm anxious for nothing. Right? So when anxious comes, who's sending it to you? Oh, and then your mind will tell you, oh, it's really not the devil. It's really what's going on. Yeah, but we don't deal with things by what's going on. We deal with things by going to God, getting his wisdom on what's going on. Don't get it out of order because you'll find your life a little more frustrating than it needs to be. Finally, Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep them in perfect peace when their mind is focused on the Lord. What kind of peace will he keep us? Perfect peace. That's peace squared. That means that you won't be upset about anything. Amen. Your conversation won't be filled with you. Everyone say, I'm trying to get rid of the I in my conversation. So that I don't say I, I want, I, I, I. You know what I mean? You got it. So that you say we and God and I instead of putting the I there. What did Satan get tossed out of heaven for saying? I will, I will, I will. I said it five times and God says, no, you won't. Boom. <laughs> pride is a bad thing for Christians. And pride only dwells in our flesh. Pride, you don't have a prideful mind too much because you can catch yourself at that. But your flesh will have pride. For example, depression. How many ever had a bout with depression? Me. Depression is pride. Pride in reverse, because you're dwelling on who? The other pride is, what do we call it? When a man's all into, a woman's all into themselves. Yeah, amen. That's the other kind of pride. And that's ugly too. Everyone say, God resists the proud. Gives grace to his kids. I'm a surrendered child of God. Jesus lives in my heart. I choose to follow him and die to myself. Give the Lord a big hand clap this morning, will you?